Hello and welcome to the channel. In today's video, we'll be heading to East Harling, Norfolk. East Harling is a small village about five miles outside Banham. It's a quiet place, known for its large fields, and is a popular place for people to walk their dogs. On the morning of the 5th of August 2017, Anne and Nigel Precious were walking their dogs in this idyllic setting, where they came across two unattended dogs. Wondering where their owner could be, they began to look for them. It wouldn't be long before Anne would track them down, where she would find a man slumped on the ground, covered in brambles. Thinking the man may have injured himself while walking the dogs, Anne went over to assist him. However, as she got closer, the full extent as to what she was witnessing became apparent. Let's begin. When the body of an elderly man was found by a married couple walking their dogs, police were quickly notified of the horrifying scene. The area was swiftly cordoned off, where police got to work trying to figure out just what had happened. Blood was visible on the pathway up to where the body was found, suggesting that the victim had been dragged to his final resting place. The injuries sustained were devastating. It was initially speculated that the victim may have fallen prey to an animal attack, possibly by his own dogs, or by an escaped animal, as Banham Zoo wasn't far from the location of the body. Police also got to work identifying the victim, and quickly learned that he was 83-year-old Peter Wrighton. Peter and his wife Anne were married for 59 years, and had moved to Banham to retire 30 years previously. He was a father of two, and regularly visited the heath in East Harling to walk his dogs. Before retiring, he had worked for BT for 35 years. He was described as a good man, a loving father, and a dedicated husband. When he failed to return home, Anne had grown concerned that he may have suffered a medical emergency, and left her home to travel to the heath to look for Peter. But when she arrived, the police were already present. They informed Anne of the tragic news and helped her home to grieve. Peter's cause of death was investigated. Skeptical of the animal attack theory, they still needed to definitively look into what happened to the poor man. They would soon discover that something far worse was roaming the popular dog walking area that morning. With no visible indication that Peter's dogs had attacked him, nor were there any reports that any dangerous animals had escaped Banham Zoo, police were understandably worried that something far more nefarious had happened to Peter. Unfortunately, their fears would be confirmed. Peter's body was examined, where it was found that he had likely been attacked from behind. He sustained 45 stab wounds, as well as several lacerations across his throat, which had almost removed his head from his body. Defensive wounds were also found, showing that Peter had tried to fight back, albeit unsuccessfully. Whoever attacked Peter then dragged his body off the path, leaving a trail of blood behind, where they then attempted to hide his body in the brambles. Anne was notified of their findings, and a murder investigation was underway. Investigators began to dig deep into Peter's history to look for any potential enemies that may have wanted to do this to him, but could find no one. They also checked into his family history, as well as looking into the relationships with his wife and children. Again, there were no indications that they would want to harm him. Anne was at home on the morning of the attack, and his children were confirmed to be nowhere near at the time of the murder. The relationship was also very strong, eliminating any possibility that they may have been involved. Investigators also turned their attention to tracing back Peter's steps on the 5th of August. They recovered CCTV footage of Peter visiting Kenninghall Post Office at around 10am, and his car was seen driving towards the park at 10.14am, 
just half an hour before his body was found. The footage was released to the public, in the hope that someone may come forward with information. Investigators also set up patrols in the East Harling woodlands, questioning dog walkers as to their whereabouts and whether they had noticed anything strange that morning. While this was ongoing, theories as to why Peter was murdered continued to be drawn up. They ruled out the possibility of it being a robbery that went wrong, as all of Peter's belongings were still found on his person. Another possible reason was that he may have stumbled upon a drug deal taking place at the time. However, this would also be written off as a possibility. One other explanation that was explored, but also ruled out, was that it was a case of mistaken identity. Paul Pelham Wrighton, otherwise known as Peter Wrighton, without the W, was a child protection expert and social care worker who was convicted of abusing children back in 1992. While this was looked into, it was ruled out as being highly unlikely, as the victim bore little resemblance to the convicted sex offender, as well as his namesake passing a decade earlier, in October 2007. A witness also came forward and told police that they had witnessed two elderly men arguing on the morning of Peter's murder, However, after they followed this up, they learned that this was unconnected. While no motive had yet been established, forensics were able to recover DNA not belonging to Peter on his clothing. Police inquiries had also led to two potential leads, and they appealed to the media for these men to come forward to assist with their investigation. Naturally, the locals were shocked that potentially someone from their own community could have committed such a heinous act. People commented that they had stopped visiting the park and were wary of their own neighbours. Police had also warned locals to steer clear of the woods as it was possible that the killer may still be there. Those who were questioned by police at the park were even concerned that they may be wrongly accused worried that investigators may mistake their own footprints or DNA being linked to the murder. The two men were tracked down, and both had their fingerprints and DNA taken. Police would rule the pair out, but one of the men, Peter Bibby, would provide crucial details relating to what he saw on the morning of Peter's murder. Peter told police that on the morning of Peter's murder, he had been on the heath walking his dog, where he witnessed a man who he didn't recognise as being one of the locals. The man, who wasn't walking a dog of his own, was described by Peter as being a young man who was wearing heavy-duty flip-flops and shorts, which he commented was odd as it wasn't suitable attire for where he was seen walking. Furthermore, Bibby stated that the man appeared focused, as if he had a reason to be at the park. He said that he was within touching distance of this man, and that he didn't speak to him, but if he tried to, it was unlikely that he would have responded to him. Bibby then assisted police with creating an e-fit of the man he saw at the heath that morning. This e-fit was then distributed to the media. One man would come across this image and contact police with a name, Alexander Palmer. The man, who wished to remain anonymous, informed investigators that he was a psychologist who had treated Palmer. Police now had a name, they just needed to find out more about him. So who was Alexander Palmer? Let's find out. At the time of the attack, Alexander was 23 years old and had no previous convictions. He served in the British Army until 2015. He had qualified as a commando, one of the few in his year who was successful in qualifying. In March 2014, Alexander got into an altercation with another trainee, resulting in Alexander having his head stamped on. This incident is believed to have brought about mental health issues which would persist with him in the years since. 
after being medically discharged from the army in 2015. He would be in and out of mental health services, where he was looked after by several psychologists. It was one of these psychologists who reported their concerns to the police. Alex would tell psychologists that he would hear a voice in his head that he would go on to name Little Alex. He told psychologists that he had a particular dislike towards dog walkers and expressed a desire to cause harm to them. He was living in Kringleford, Norwich, at the time police tracked him down. With Palmer in police custody, his fingerprints and DNA were taken and fast-tracked for processing. They also got to work gathering evidence to build their case against him. As news of Palmer's arrest became public knowledge, Peter Bibby searched Alexander's name on Facebook. After searching through various profiles, he found Alexander's page and immediately recognised him as being the man he witnessed at the park that morning. Several of Alexander's clothes were also sent for forensic testing, where they would discover DNA on a pair of trousers which didn't belong to Palmer. This DNA would go on to match Peter. Furthermore, DNA found on Peter would later match Palmer. Additionally, automated number plate recognition devices, or ANPR, picked up Palmer's car on the A11, heading towards the heath on the morning Peter was killed. His mobile phone records were also examined, which showed him standing on the heath at 10.19am, where he would stay for just under 33 minutes. His car is then picked up again on ANPR devices, heading north on the A11, leading police to believe that he had planned the attack in advance. This was further supported when they had learned that he had visited the heath two weeks prior to the attack. Police searched his car and found a map with the heath marked. However, they were unable to recover the murder weapon. One other piece of evidence they discovered was a notebook found in a storage facility Palmer owned, which chillingly stated that he was considering going for dog walkers and that he hated dog walkers. He also said that if he followed through with his plan, it would be considered up there with the big ones, that everyone would look up to him and everyone would know his name. Police interviewed Alexander Palmer. Just for the purposes of the DVD, Alex, can I get you to introduce yourself, please, with your full name and your date of birth? Uh, Alexander Hobbs Palmer, uh, born 8th of the 9th, 93. Thank you. Is there a different Alex? Uh, at times, yes. Okay, who's he? He used to manifest himself as a physical hallucination, but now he's just a voice. Is he still with us? Yes. Is he here today? Yes. Where is he now? What is in my head? He's there, is he? What, behind you, or...? It's... Yeah, like it's coming from behind me, but also in, in my head. So was Alex there that day? Um... The other Alex? Uh, I, he's always there, so he's he always is. there. So he would have been with you, okay? Was he? Do you remember him talking to you on that day? No. You don't. No. And, but you say he talks to you every day. Yes. He's there laughing at you. Laughing. But you you say he doesn't tell you what to do. No. He doesn't force you to do things or anything like that. No. Okay. Tell me about your registration plate, because that's unusual. <laughs> What's the story behind that? That's what my uh, Catholic. Um, grandmother-in-law keeps saying. Um, yeah. it was what, just with the 666? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how, how did you come by that registration plate? My mum got it for my birthday. Okay, so is there any significance to the numbers? No, just no. no. I'm a little devil. <laughs> and she's just... Was that the joke, was yeah. it? As I said, the an EFIT was prepared from a description. Have a look at that. What would you say about that? It's a pretty good likeness. Okay. What sort of knife is it, Alex? Uh, one you see there. Uh, but what 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 what's what's its purpose? Uh, to look good. 
Can you explain to me why your DNA is on that man? I'm afraid I can't without knowing. You don't need to know. It's irrelevant where it is. You say you haven't met him. Why is your DNA on him? For instance, I could have lost a hair follicle and <laughs> caught on his shoe. Um, that's just me speculating, but uh, without knowing, I couldn't venture a guess. Okay. Or explain. How would you see that image? On the news. On the news. What on television news? No, on uh, my phone. On your phone. So going through. Okay. Had you taken an interest in it? I had, because it said he's Harling, and uh, I knew he's Harling. Yeah. Did it say the date? Uh, I think so. Would have, yeah. yeah, okay. Did you not think at any point I would have been there on that date? Uh, you know, no, no, I uh, didn't think about it. Do you not think to yourself, well, actually, I was down in the woods at that point, I better phone in and let the police know? And say what? Say I was there as other people have been doing, many hundreds of people have been doing, phoning in about this murder. Yes. That's normal behaviour, isn't it? To phone in, I was there. Either you saw something or didn't see something. Um, so what, what, can you tell me why you didn't phone in? I didn't think about it. See, I would suggest to you there's nothing random about it. You have an interest in knives and weaponry and militaria. You have an interest in dissection and killing. It's not random. No, but it's... You've got an interest, haven't you? I do. You have a fascination, don't you? I do. There's nothing random about that, Alex. No, but it's... You collect weapons, you own weapons, you've been in the forces, you know the tactics. To me, it just seems... You know how to kill somebody, don't you? You've you been be... trained. See it from my point of view, where I'm sitting, how does this look? Uh, it looks suspicious. Oh, it's more than suspicious, Alex. I'll ask you again, were you involved in the murder of Peter Wrighton? No comment. Alexander admitted to being at the park on the morning of the attack, but denied having any involvement with Peter's murder. He would be charged with the murder of Peter Wrighton, and a psychological assessment was carried out on Alexander, which deemed him fit to stand trial. In February 2018, Alexander Palmer attended Nottingham Crown Court, charged with the murder of 83-year-old Peter Wrighton. The jury heard how Peter had been attacked from behind, as well as the motivations behind his murder, citing Alexander's history of mental illness and a desire to harm dog walkers. Anne Precious took the stand and told the jury her account of finding Peter. She was visibly upset at recalling finding tram lines in the grass leading up to where Peter's body was, indicating he had been dragged. Among other evidence and witness testimonies, the defence argued that the attack wasn't pre-planned and that Alexander was a victim of his own mental state. However, after being sent away to determine Alexander's fate, it only took the jury 45 minutes to return with a guilty verdict. They were convinced that despite his mental health, Alexander Palmer had planned this chilling attack. The following month, Alexander Palmer was handed a life sentence, with a minimum term set for 28 years. Mr Justice Goose, who sentenced Palmer, said that, quote, Your offence was substantially aggravated in its seriousness, firstly by the fact that there was a significant degree of planning and of premeditation for this murder. Secondly, the victim was particularly vulnerable, 
being aged 83 and alone. Thirdly, by the extent of the savage violence you used to kill him. You took a knife and drove to the scene for the sole purpose of murder. You attacked the deceased for no other reason than he was walking his dogs. At the age of 83 and slightly built, he was no match for the violence of your attack. End quote. Peter's children, Andrew and Carol, watched on as Palmer was taken away to begin his prison sentence. This is another case that we're becoming all too familiar with on this channel, where an individual with a recorded history of mental illness carries out a senseless attack on someone who had the misfortune of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Peter Bibby has expressed regret at failing to engage with Palmer, but in all honesty, how could he have predicted what was about to happen? After all, East Harling isn't exactly a place where you'd expect such a tragedy to take place. Alexander's mother and stepfather have also criticised mental health professionals since, stating that they had reported their concerns to them after he began to amass a collection of knives. It was documented that professionals discussed this with Palmer, advising him to get rid of his collection of knives. But they failed to follow up on this, satisfied that he would follow through on their guidance. My deepest condolences go out to Peter's family and friends. Thank you for watching. If you found this video informative, please consider subscribing to the channel, as well as hitting the notification bell so you never miss an upload. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.